So this is the third year in a row I've had my Regents Physics students complete a massive number of questions. In fact, since the 2002 Regents exam when it changed, there have been 1,066 questions. This year my students did 466 of them. Not all the questions were done by all the students, but it was a sampling of all of them. I did spreadsheet magic and I produce a list of the most missed questions by my students in order. I've been doing this for three years now. This is the 2016 version. If you want the PDF of these 40 questions, go here, or 2015 or 2014, just change the link. MrHosey.com slash review will take you to a playlist with this video and the ones from the previous years. If you'd like to see the answers to the questions, they're here, and I'll scroll through those. And then here are the remainder. It tells you what year, month, and question it was and what the general topics were. If you'd like to know how the topics show up or at what rate they show up, I've counted all the questions from these different topics, uh, at least these broad topics, and you can see the exam across the top, and you can see the percentage of the exam that had those questions on it. It's been very stable, as you can see. If you just like the pick C kind of strategy, it doesn't work very well. They've done a nice job over the years of keeping it very consistent. They've never had more than 33% any given choice or any less than, uh, well, 13%. Wow, I guess that is interesting. But it really hasn't changed that much. Overall, it's pretty even. So don't pick a choice by the letter just because. What I'm going to do for each question is give you about five seconds to read it. I'll pause. I'll write the answer down. And then I'll go through an attempt to be very brief in my explanation of it, but hopefully useful. First question. The answer is A. This has been the most missed question this year. Now, for one thing, they give you the speed here. And on the reference table, you can see the speed of sound in air. You can see the speed of light, or sorry, the speed of sound in air is about 331 meters per second. See how it's about twice as fast. My attempt at drawing water in air. Yes, I can barely draw water. A lot of people think of this as a Snell's Law kind of question. You're thinking N equals C over V. So as you go to air, it travels almost as fast as it does in a vacuum. In water, it slows down. That's not what's going on here. That's a light wave. That's an electromagnetic wave that doesn't even require a medium. Here we have a mechanical wave that requires a physical medium. S physical waves, such as sound, tend to travel the fastest when the molecules are closer together. So sound waves are going to travel fastest in solids, a little slower in liquids, and a lot slower in air because the molecules are further apart. As an aside, sound is not only a mechanical wave that requires a medium, it's a longitudinal wave. So you have regions where it's squished and then stretched, and these are called compressions, and these areas of stretchers are called refractions. They're kind of like peaks and troughs with a sine wave, but it's still uh, going to vibrate the mechanical medium. In this case, being a longitudinal wave, those vibrations are left-right, and the wave is propagating to the right. Now, in general, when you have a wave pass from one medium to another, it is important to remember that the part of the wave that does not change, or the characteristic of the wave that does not change, is the frequency. The frequency is like the social security number of a wave. It stays exactly the same. So when a wave does change mediums, the reason it's changing speed is because the wavelength is changing, but the frequency is the same the entire time. So the best choice here is that the wave speed decreases. It's going into... Uh, uh, less dense uh, molecules, and its frequency remains the same. Question two. The answer is A. Now one thing, the way this printed, this should say ohms. And two, I think what confused students was the concept of a variable resistor. If you just redraw this, it's a lot easier to answer. Here we have a resistance that's changing, and as the resistance increases, and the voltage stays the same, the current has to decrease. While we're here, notice two things. The ammeter is always connected in series. And also, there is a slight distinction between a battery and a cell, should you have to draw one. I often, in class, draw batteries like this, but that's not actually a battery. That's a cell. A battery is a couple of those put together. So if you're drawing the symbol, just be careful. 
Question three. The answer is B. Again, the speed of sound in air is 331 meters per second. And the frequency they give you is 512 hertz. So the wavelength is 0.646 meters. Question four. This is a very basic question, but every year it seems to befuddle my students. I should probably do something about that. This is a type of mechanical wave. It's a sound wave. And it's a longitudinal wave. Remember, you have two kinds of waves. You have transverse, which is like a sine wave, where the vibration is perpendicular to the direction of the propagation. In a longitudinal wave, the vibration is in the same direction. So I'm attempting to draw stretch, squish, stretch, squish, stretch, squish. These regions are what are known as compressions. They're the analogy of the peak or the crest. And then these regions are called rarefactions. Now in both cases, the individual pieces of the medium don't move in the direction of the wave. At least they don't travel very far. In the case of a transverse wave, they're vibrating up and down. In the case of a longitudinal wave, they're vibrating back and forth in the same direction as the propagation. So while the energy moves to the right in this picture, the vibration moves back and forth right and left, but doesn't travel very far. So if the wave's traveling east-west, the vibration has to be east-west. Five. The answer is C. For the same reason as before, sound is a longitudinal wave. The vibration is in the same direction as the actual direction of motion. And it's these compressions that ultimately move your eardrum and you hear sound. Six. This is a straightforward centripetal force question, or uniform circular motion question. So when you have something going around, for example, the students, there's a couple vectors to know. One of them is that at this particular moment, the velocity is going this direction. And if you were to remove the force, they would continue going in that straight line tangential to the circle, hence tangential velocity. This question asks about the acceleration. Well, in uniform circular motion, the acceleration is always directed centripetally. That just means towards the center. So what happens is the net force is in the centripetal direction towards the center. And the acceleration is always in the same direction as the centripetal force. So the acceleration is towards the center. By the way, the magnitude of that acceleration is equal to v squared over r. Not that that's relevant here. But the direction is towards the center. Now, if you had the person at this location, for example, well, then their force and their acceleration would be directed still centripetally, but here it would mean down. So the answer to this question is A. Question seven. Again, it's the same concept, uh, transverse versus longitudinal. Here, the wave is propagating from west to east, but the vibration is north and south. So if the direction of propagation is this way, but the vibration is this way, they're perpendicular, that's the definition of a transverse wave. The answer is A. Question eight. Now, vector is a quantity that has both a magnitude and a direction. I suspect that the problem with this question is the idea of field. Students get confused anytime we have a field. An electric field, which is a vector, so I like to put an arrow over it, is an amount of force per charge. There's something similar, gravitational field, at least near the surface of the Earth, is 9.81 meters per second squared down. That is a force, but it's a gravitational force, per mass. So it's a force per charge. Since force is a vector, it has direction. Electric field is also a vector. As an aside, let's say you had an electron. The force on any positive charge would be directed towards the center of that electron, although it would be a small center. Um, these are vectors representing the electric field. They're electric field lines. Notice these field lines are closer the closer you get to the charge, reflecting 
the stronger force. Now, if you knew the electric field value there, which by the way, has units of Newtons per Coulomb, and let's say that that electric field had a value of two Newtons per Coulomb, and let's say I told you I placed three Coulombs there, I then know F equals QE, that force would be three Coulombs times two Newtons per Coulomb, which would be six Newtons. But to answer this question, uh, electric field is a vector because force is a vector. Electric potential, by the way, as long as I'm going on tangents, is an amount of energy or work per charge. Since work doesn't have a direction, it's a scalar, electric potential is a scalar. Electric potential, very similarly, if you knew the electric potential at this point, would tell you the amount of energy per coulomb of charge. So they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. Uh, the, the units for electric potential would be joules per coulomb, or most people just use a volt. Nine. This is the principle of superposition. You want to imagine what's going to happen when this goes ahead and meets this. Those two added together is going to be something down because there's a bigger down than up. In fact, if this was minus two and this was plus one, you're going to end up with minus one for the, the size. So superposition, you're literally going to add them. Now with constructive and destructive interference, which is another word for superposition, if they line up in the same orientation, like both up, you're going to get constructive interference. If one was up and one was down, like it is in this case, you're going to get destructive interference. And that can be complete or incomplete. Meaning if I had a plus one and a minus one and they met, you would actually get completely destructive interference and it would look like this. It's important to remember both pulses live in the medium at the same time, but their energies add and you can have the net result being an amplitude at a particular point of being zero. But both energies are actually there. It's, it's the superposition is all we can see. We can see what the string or whatever the medium actually does. But the answer to this question is B. Question 10. D. And the answer is that work, on the one hand, is force times distance, but it's also the change in total energy. And total energy is made up of potential, which is not changing because it's not changing height. It's made up of kinetic, which is changing. And because it's not heating up, there's no energy uh, lost to thermal energy, no internal energy. Uh, and the reason I know that is because it's a frictionless surface. So there's nothing to do any non-conservative work. So you're left with all of the work that's done has to be going into the kinetic energy. Question 11. B. Most people want to jump to Coulomb's law, which will tell you the force between two charges. Notice it doesn't matter whether you're figuring the force on charge 2 on 1 or 1 on 2. You get the same answer. Put another way, the force of B on A, whoops, should point the other way, of B on A is the same as the force of A on B. This is just Newton's third law. As hard as A pushes B, B pushes A. If I push a person, they push me. If I kiss a person, they kiss me. If annoying brother pushes you or touches you, you're touching them. Same concept. Uh, big truck hits a little car. The little car feels the same force the big truck does, or the big truck feels the same force as the little car. This is a very confusing point for students, but it doesn't need to be. Every force is an interaction of two objects, and they feel equal forces, but in opposite directions. Whether it's gravity, electrostatics, doesn't matter. Same force, same magnitude anyway. Twelve. D. You're lifting a block that has a mass of 2 kilograms, a height of 15 meters, and a time that's 6 seconds. So really what you're doing is you're doing work. Now power is work divided by time. In this case you can think of that as a force times a distance divided by time. And that force is equal to the weight force, mg, times the distance, which is h, divided by time. Alternatively, you can think of it as the change in the potential energy, because that's what's changing here, divided by time, which again is just going to be mgh divided by time. So no matter how you do it, when you plug in the numbers, 
you get a power of 49 watts. To be extra sneaky, notice some of the choices have joules, some of them have watts. Joules is a unit of energy. Power is the rate at which you use energy. So this is 49 watts or 49 joules per second. 13. A. This is a vector addition question. First of all, what makes it a little harder is they're not actually asking you to find the resultant. They're asking you to find what you add to the first vector to get the resultant. That's like saying 2 plus x is 5. Find x. But this is vector, so direction matters. So when you add vectors, you have two ways to add them. One way is to use what I call the head-to-tail method. Well, I don't. I mean, a lot of people call it the head-to-tail method. And in the head-to-tail method, you take the first vector, and then you draw the second vector with the tail of the second vector at the head of the last vector. And then the resultant goes from the tail of the first vector to the head of the last vector. So this, this is the vector you're looking for. Now, while we're at it, there's another way to add vectors. If I was to draw the second vector with the tail connected, like so, and imagine you made a parallelogram, the resultant would be from the diagonal, from the where the tails meet, to the other corner of the parallelogram, and that's going to be the resultant. Either way you do it, you're going to get the same answer. While we're on the subject, they love asking max and min vector questions. What's the biggest you can get when you add a 2-newton vector to a 3-newton vector? Answer? 5 newtons when it's in the same direction as the two vectors. What's the smallest number you can get for a magnitude when you add a 2 newton vector to a 3 newton vector? 1 newton when the angle between them is 180 degrees. Any other angle is going to give you a result in somewhere in between those two numbers. Question 14. B. This is a question about the wave particle duality. You may recall that if you have waves approaching a slit or a barrier, and that slit size is similar in size to the wavelength, you're going to get diffraction. The light will actually bend like so. This happens with ocean waves um, near jetties and things like that. It will also happen with light waves if you use a small enough slit. You can get the waves to spread out. It's the reason you can hear me if you're outside the room and the sound waves diffract through the door but light waves are very small compared to the slit opening, so they don't really diffract through an open door. But back to this question. It turns out that if matter is small enough, like an electron, it actually behaves like a wave. So imagine electrons are coming through here, through this slit. You might think the electrons will land here, but they don't. Some of them do, but you also get some over here, some over here, some over here, some over here. They spread out much like the light waves did. So that's an example of matter acting like a wave. So what's an example of a wave acting like matter? This is a poorly drawn flashlight. Out of this flashlight shines light. Now this light is a wave, but it also acts like a particle, hence the duality, almost like a paradox. So light waves hit a piece of metal. And what happens is actually a surprising result where you can get electrons to jump off of the surface. They will leave, or the fancy term is be ejected from the surface of the metal if that light has a high enough energy. Meaning, if I shine, for example, ultraviolet light, I can get an electron to leave the surface, where if I shine, say, infrared, it may not have enough energy. This process where we treat light like a particle or a photon that ejects electrons is called the photoelectric effect. Uh, and this is 1905 Einstein. He's a really smart guy. It's not just E equals mc squared. Now the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant h times the frequency of that photon. Now this metal ha has a work function or a certain amount of energy, meaning the photon needs to have at least that much energy or you're not going to get any electrons to leave. That's why uh, an infrared might not work, but a higher frequency uh, ultraviolet very well might. Different metals have different work functions. If you were to look at the kinetic energy of the electrons versus the frequency, it would look like this. The slope of this line would be equal to h. This point right here is called the cutoff frequency, and the kinetic energy of the electrons would be equal to the photon energy of the light wave, or the photon, coming in minus the work function. So the photoelectric effect is light acting like a particle, and electron diffraction is particles acting like waves, wave-particle duality. I know I went pretty big tangent there, but I'm hoping there is value. 15. 
C. When you launch projectiles and they land at the same height, the optimal angle is 45 degrees. This will give you the maximum range. 45 degrees. Let's say you were to launch it at 60 degrees. It's always more fun when you have sound effects. Let's say you launch it at 30 degrees. Couple things to notice. First of all, 45 degrees gives you the maximum range. 60 degrees puts you in the air more time, but you go shorter. Now the complement of that, 30 degrees, will be in the air for much less time, but will go the same distance as 60 degrees. It's complementary angle. That's true for all, 15 and 75, 60 and 30, which is what this is, 55, uh, 35, you get the idea. The X and Y components are completely independent. When a projectile goes through the air, it has a constant horizontal speed because there's no acceleration horizontally, sideways. That's because there's no net force sideways. There is, however, a force downward due to the weight, which leads to a constant acceleration of minus 9.8 meters per second squared down, at least at the surface of the Earth. The combination of those two effects gives you the parabolic path that we're used to. Now, the reason 45 works out best in a qualitative way is that when you launch it at 90 degrees, that's going to give you the most time in the air. But you have no range because there's no horizontal component. If you were to go at a low angle, like 30, you're going to have a big horizontal component, but your initial vertical component in the Y isn't very large, so you don't spend much time in the air, not enough time to go very far. 60 degrees gives you the same range, but a different way. You're not going very fast horizontally, but you're going fast enough vertically that you go higher and you spend more time in the air. And it always works out for the same landing height as launch height that complementary angles will give you the same range. So reading this question a little bit more carefully, 45 degrees versus 60 degrees, they're saying the 45 degree angle. So the 45 degree angle is going to have a shorter flight time than the 60, that's true, and it's going to have a longer range. So that's the best answer. 16, B. Think of this just as a resistor. Resistance is equal to rho L over A, which actually has nothing to do with this question. This is about temperature. So qualitatively, you need to know that as the temperature goes up, the resistance goes up. Easiest way to think about this is P equals V squared over R. We're not changing the voltage of the battery. That's still 10 volts, but we are changing the resistance. So P is proportional to 1 over R. As R gets bigger, P gets smaller. Because the bottom of the fraction getting bigger makes it smaller. Now, while we're here, resistors in general, or anything, wires, the resistance depends on property of the material, the resistivity. Not that you need it for this problem, but page 4 of the reference table has the resistivities for some materials. You also need to know that as a wire gets longer, the resistance goes up. And because the A is on the bottom, it turns out that thinner wires actually have more resistance than fatter wires. Of course, the way the question was worded, the temperature decreases. So that's going to mean the resistance is going to decrease and the power is going to increase. 17. B. Now this is one where students get a little mixed up because of compasses and their experience with them pointing towards the North Pole. The compass will always align itself with the direction of the magnetic field. But what students don't necessarily realize is that on the Earth, not that you need to know this to answer this question, but if this is the Earth, the geographic North Pole is actually a magnetic South Pole. And you guessed it, the geographic south is a magnetic north pole. So the magnetic field near the Earth is pointing roughly like this. So the compass, while it's pointing to what we consider the north pole, is actually pointing to the geographic south pole. In fact, this magnetic pole is not in the same place as the geographic north pole. It's off by something like 600 miles. In fact, it, it moves. It's moved about... 600 miles in the last century, I remember reading, uh, and it flips every 200,000 years or so. So a lot of interesting stuff there, but most of that won't help you on the regions. The regions very lightly test magnetism, almost no questions. And if you do, it's likely to be a compass. And when it is a compass, 
the magnetic field lines tell you the direction the compass is going to point. 18. Man, this gets a lot of students every single year. And it's not the concept of reflection. Reflection's an easy concept. The angle of incidence is the same as the angle of reflection. What's confusing is that that angle has to be measured relative to the normal. So in this diagram, when this is 65 degrees, that tells you the angle of incidence is 90 minus that, or 25 degrees, which means the angle of reflection is 25 degrees. Same is true when you have refraction. You have to measure the angle relative to the normal. So say you have a light ray coming in like this, and then it's going to slow down towards the normal like this. This is the angle of incidence, not this. Bad. And this is the angle of refraction, not this. Bad. So don't get fooled by the normal. 19. I'm willing to bet you know this is a kinematics question. But did you pick the right equation? How do you know how to pick the right equation? So many equations. I tell students all year long something really, really cheesy, which is that if you want to see the big picture, sometimes you have to draw the big picture. What do I mean by that? You want to draw a picture where you have an initial position and a final position, and you write down the things you know. The 25 newtons is absolutely irrelevant. Things fall at the same rate regardless of weight as long as there's no air resistance. Rest, that's like a keyword. That's telling you that the initial velocity is zero. So it starts here and ends here, and you know that the initial velocity is zero meters per second. We know that it falls for a time of one second, and that falls with an acceleration that's equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared down. Now we have to pick an equation. And whenever you pick an equation in kinematics, or really any time in regions physics, you always pick an equation where you know everything except the thing you're trying to find out. In this question, we're trying to find the displacement. We know the initial velocity, we know the time, and we know the acceleration. So this is the appropriate equation to use. Good reminder to always on B2 and C, write out the equation before plugging in anything. Then you have to show the substitution with the numbers and the units. Negative 9.8, 9.8, it doesn't really matter. The negative sign just shows you that it's down. You just have to be consistent. If positive direction is down, then your acceleration is positive 9.8. If down is negative, you can put negative. It doesn't matter. So let's put negative. When you plug that in, you're going to get a displacement of minus 4.9 meters. Of course, the magnitude of that is a distance of 4.9 meters. That happens to be down. The answer is C. 20. A. First of all, what's going on here is you have a block and it's being pushed to the right with some force and there's a backwards force from the friction and it's sliding at a constant speed. Now those of you who've had me in class know I have a silly thing I do sometimes where I say, because they're keywords, right? The fact that it's a constant speed is a huge keyword. Because it's a constant speed, that tells you that the acceleration is zero. That also tells you the F net is zero. And what I like to say is, Eureka, we've done it. We've balanced the forces. Net force is zero. Constant velocity in a straight line. So here you have an applied force and you have a friction force. And those two must be equal. Because it's sliding, that friction force must be a kinetic friction force. Remember, there's two kinds of friction force, static and kinetic. If you've ever moved a couch, when you first go to push it, you push harder because you're trying to overcome the larger static friction force. Once it's moving, it's a little bit easier. The kinetic friction force is always somewhat lower. So the friction force is always some fraction of the normal force. Now, in many cases, a box on a surface, for example, the normal force is exactly equal in magnitude to the weight force. There are times where it's not. For example, if you're pushing down on the block while trying to pull it sideways, or maybe you're on an inclined plane, ramp, something like that. But here it's a level surface, so that's the same as the weight force. So I know that that number is 60 newtons. They gave that to us in the problem. So we just need to know what this mu is, this coefficient of friction. So we can look that up on the table. Rubber, dry, asphalt rubber dry asphalt and it's moving so it's kinetic so this coefficient of friction is 
seven, which is going to give us a friction force that is equal to 40 newtons. As an aside, this mu you can also think of as a ratio of the friction force to the normal force. And because it's force over force, it has no units. It's one of the few things in this course where it actually has no units, and putting a unit would be wrong. Another one would be index of refraction. 21. When a photon comes in, it can excite a hydrogen atom by causing an electron that's in the ground state to jump up to one of these higher levels or jump up to one and then to another. Depending on how much energy you put in tells you what energy level it goes to. Now interestingly, it's quantized, meaning you have to have exactly the right amount of energy or that photon will pass through and not be absorbed at all. Now in this particular case, they only used 9.4 electron volts coming in. The difference, if we take 13.6 minus 3.4 electron volts, that gives us 10.2 electron volts. That means this photon doesn't even have the energy necessary to get up to the second energy level, let alone the higher ones. So it simply cannot be absorbed. It doesn't have enough energy. 22. B. Now this is a helium nucleus. So remember, helium, four, two. Basically it has two protons and it has two neutrons. This is a question about the standard model. So a reminder that matter is always either a hadron or a lepton. A lepton means it's one of these six things. You've heard of the electron, you may have heard of the muon or the tau or the neutrinos. So you've got those six leptons and their antiparticles, by the way, which are identical in every way except that, well, not every way, but the main way they're different is that they have the opposite charge, but they have the same mass. There is this interesting bit where if a particle meets its antiparticle, they annihilate into pure energy. That's cool. But nowhere in this list of leptons is either proton or neutron. That must mean protons and neutrons are hadrons. Hadrons are made of quarks. So these are the six quarks we have, and you guessed that we have antiquarks. And you just kind of have to know, because it comes up, that protons and neutrons are made of three quarks. So when things are made of quarks, they're either a baryon, in which case they have three, or they're a meson, in which case they have two quarks. You'll never observe a quark by itself. It has a fractional charge, but it'll never be observed by itself. It's always in part of a particle. So the only particles we ever see have whole integer amounts of charge, meaning multiples of an elementary charge. So uh, protons and neutrons are both made of three quarks. So therefore, they are baryons. So you've got two times three quarks, and you've got two times three quarks for the neutron, giving you a total of 12 quarks. The answer is 12. While we're at it, the Regents loves to ask about possible particles, meaning how can you combine quarks and have a particle that's real or potentially real? A particle is real or possible if it has a whole integer of elementary charges, meaning you can be anywhere from minus two elementary charges, minus one, zero, one, or two. You can't have three, you can't have 0.5, you can't have two thirds, it's always gotta be some fraction. And you get that by making these charges. Uh, to get minus two, for example, you could go with uh, a minus up, a minus, by the way, put a bar over it, that's the antiparticle. Uh, an anti-charm and an anti-top would be one way to do that. Uh, to get minus one, you could do uh, a down strange bottom, which would be a baryon. You could also, by the way, do an anti-up and a down, for example. Now, there's all sorts of combinations. Most of these particles don't live very long, but these are the possible particles. They have to add up to a whole integer uh, number of elementary charge units. Hopefully I'm not distracting too much. 23. D, and the reason is this formula, R equals rho L over A, the resistance of a wire is proportional to one over the area. We talked about this earlier. Fatter wires have less resistance. 24. Let's have a look at the formulas. Tension energy of a spring, if you recall, depends on how far it's stretched from its rest position and the spring constant, K. 
k equals f over x. It's a measure of how hard you have to pull or push on a spring to get it to stretch one meter. But when you look at these two formulas, they're exactly the same formula, right down to the half. Potential energy of a spring depends on the distance squared, and kinetic energy depends on the velocity squared, or the magnitude of velocity speed. It's basically an analogy. 25. D. What you need to know is that ammeters are connected in series. They measure the current through an element of the circuit. Voltmeters are connected in parallel. They measure the voltage across. So the current here would flow like this through the ammeter. There's no way to get through resistor 1 without flowing through this ammeter. So this ammeter tells you the current going through resistor 1. The voltmeter here touches both sides of the resistor, so it measures the voltage of, across. While we're on it, the regions doesn't really ask this, but ammeters have very low resistance because they don't want to change the current. Voltmeters have very high resistance because they don't want to change um, the voltage going across the uh, resistor or the current going through it. But current goes through ammeters and voltage is measured across resistors. So voltmeters are always connected in parallel, ammeters are always connected in series. 26. Oh, this gets so many students. Inertia is the same thing as mass. Mass is the resistance to a change in motion. Your velocity has nothing to do with it. But you may be thinking of momentum where velocity does matter, P equals mv. This choice, which I suspect a number of people took, is the most something, which is why it feels so satisfying, but that something is momentum, not inertia. If the question is which has the inertia, it's simply which one has the most mass. 27. D. Recall, power is work divided by time, or work is power times time. This is the same thing, but we're using electrical power. In this particular case, since we know the I, the current, and we know the voltage, V, we're going to do power equals IV, or work is power times time equals IVT, and then you substitute in with units. Now this one they gave it to you in seconds, sometimes they like to put that as a minute, put one minute or two minutes, and you need to make sure you put that in seconds in order to do the question. But the answer is 18 joules. 28. B. Let's draw a picture. So we've got a ramp with a block three meters above the ground. When that block gets to the bottom here, we're told that it has a kinetic energy of 50 joules. We're not told explicitly, but because it has no height, we know that it has a potential energy of zero joules. At the top, on the other hand, because it's not moving, we know it has a kinetic energy of zero joules. And we can figure out its potential energy from potential energy due to gravity's mgh of 58.8 joules. So the total energy is potential plus kinetic plus internal energy, which is usually heat in these problems. So at the top, the T here means total, but at the top it has just kinetic energy, which we said is 58.8 joules. At the bottom, it has no potential energy because it's on the ground. It has 50 joules of kinetic energy because we're told that. And we want to know what this internal energy is. So when we subtract these, you can see that the internal energy is 8.8 .8 joules, or approximately 9 joules. So as the block slides down and friction does some non-conservative work as this block slides down, it takes some of the energy away. If we lubricated the ramp at the bottom, it would have an energy closer to 58.8 .8 joules because friction would do less work. But in this particular problem, the work that you um, have done by friction is, is 9 joules. You sometimes see problems with a person pulling a pulley or something and then the stack of blocks goes up. 
and the potential energy gained by those blocks is always less than the work put in because real pulleys do have some friction in there so the person pulling has to do more work than the blocks gain and where does that energy go it goes into heating up the rope and the pulley etc 29 d wavelength of 1.3 times 10 to the negative 7 so we already know it's going to be somewhere around here so you could probably guess that it's ultraviolet but you can know for sure because v equals f lambda here v is the speed of light the wavelength is given and when you divide you get a frequency of 2.3 times 10 to the 15 hertz which is decidedly larger than violet so it's got to be in the ultraviolet region 30. C. A lot of students get confused because they have two velocities. On the one hand, you're going down at 1.5 meters per second. On the other hand, you're going sideways at 2 meters per second, and you're in a river or something that has a width of 30 meters. Now the 1.5 meters per second does add to the two meters per second, but there's no component horizontally. It does nothing to help you get across the shore. If you're in a speedboat going 100 miles an hour down the river, it's not going to make you go across any faster. Although it will make you go much faster down the river. So this is an independence of components thing. So the only component we care about is the two meters per second that's sideways. So since velocity is distance over time, Time is going to be distance over velocity, or displacement technically, but that distance is 30 meters divided by 2 meters per second gives you 15 seconds. 31. Centripetal, centripetal, centripetal. Centripetal merely describes a direction. It is not an actual force. So I will attempt to draw the Earth. I will attempt even more laughably to draw a space shuttle. Nope, I'm not going to try that. This is now the space shuttle. And the space shuttle is going around in a circle at a constant speed. This is uniform circular motion. It has a tangential velocity this way. And there is a force directed towards the center of the circle, a centripetal force. By the way, the acceleration is also towards the center. But that centripetal is merely a direction. And it is true that it equals mac or mv squared over r. But that's not what's causing the force. That's only the direction. What's causing the force in this case is the gravitational attraction of our whole planet Earth on this little space shuttle. This is like that problem from earlier with the two uh, charges. I believe it was problem 11. So here you have a gravitational force of attraction. But it doesn't matter whether you put M1 first, then M2, or M2, then M1. They're the same force. They're attracting one another. This is another Newton's third law question. As hard as the Earth pulls on the satellite, that satellite pulls up on the Earth. But the other name for this when you're talking about the force of attraction between, say, planet Earth and an object is its weight force. But that's really just a special case of the gravitational force of attraction. In fact, as long as I'm going off the rails... If you plug in these numbers here, like I do with my students, and you plug in big G, I'll forego units, whoops, and the mass of the Earth, and then plug in the radius of the Earth, don't forget to square it, you'll find that this magically, magically, that is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. That is little g the gravitational field strength at the surface of the Earth. So it's like a shortcut. So when we say, all right, your weight force is equal to mg, what we're really saying is you're using this equation, but as a shortcut for g, mass of the planet, over the distance from the surface to the center of the planet squared, that's little g, 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Now, some people get confused and say, isn't it 9.8 meters per second squared? That's also true. And that's because of Newton's second law, F net equals MA, A equals F net over M. 
So if the only force acting on you is your weight force, this acceleration is G, 9.8 newtons per kilogram or 9.8 meters per second squared. But that's going off the rails here. This you just had to recognize that the force that's actually making it go around the center is the weight force, the earth pulling on it. But it's my video. I can go off on whatever tangent I feel like, just like in class. And actually, if we could turn off the gravitational force between the Earth and the satellite or the space shuttle, it would go off on a tangent as well. 32. C. Let's look on the reference table at those energy levels for hydrogen again. So if you have an electron and it's been excited up to the n equals 3 level, maybe by a photon, it's not stable. It doesn't stay there long. So it's going to try to get back to the ground state. As it does that, it's going to emit a photon to get rid of that energy. One way to do that is to go directly to the ground state, so to transition from n equals 3 to n equals 1. It could also transition from n equals 3 to n equals 2, and once it's there, it's not stable in the second energy level either, so it's going to transition from 2 to 1. So you can get three different photons from each of these transitions, each with their own frequency corresponding to the energy transitions, the difference in energy between the levels. You're not being asked to in this particular problem, but you could figure out those frequencies just by subtracting these energy levels and then plugging it into this formula. Although, you have to remember that those energies in electron volts would have to be converted to joules. And should you have to do that, on the front of the reference table it tells you one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And if you're curious why that is, that comes from the definition of electric potential. Electric potential is work per charge, so work is charge times voltage. So an electron volt is the energy necessary to move one electron, charge 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, times one volt. Hence, one electron volt equals Thirty-four. Many a good physics students have gone down on this question, and I'll tell you why. Look at the axis. Normally when you do this, we do force versus the stretch distance, and you get a line that has a slope of k. f equals negative kx, Hooke's law. However, with this one, the axes are reversed. So if you were to graph x, versus f, that slope is actually 1 over k. And that's what we did here, x and f. So while most people think a has a larger spring constant, it's actually b, because the slope is less steep, because they did x versus f instead of f versus x. My condolences. 35. It's a large question, so I'll scroll. Yet another Newton's third law question. Yeah, there's a spring involved, but that's irrelevant. As hard as the boy pushes on the girl, the girl pushes on the boy. Forces are always interactions between two objects. So you are looking for a graph that is identical to the one for the boy. That's graph A. This is in the same genre of if the earth pulls on the moon and the moon pulls on the earth, which is harder, it's the same. Tractor trailer hits a small car. 
The tractor trailer feels the same force as the car, but in the opposite direction. Now, don't get that confused with Newton's second law, which is that A equals F net over M. In that example, the car would accelerate more than the truck because it has less mass for the same force, but they experience exactly the same force. I always like to say when you're driving on the highway and a bug hits your windshield or you hit the bug, in its last breath, the bug should be thinking, well, at least I hit that car as hard as it hit me. It's a moral victory. 36. C. Power equals work divided by time, which is force times distance divided by time, which in this particular distance is the weight force mg times d divided by time. So when we plug in the numbers, is 1,241 watts, which is choice C. 37. Standard model again, baryons, quarks. I actually think it's the order that the question is asked that makes this just a little bit more complicated. See, first they tell you a proton, and then they tell you a neutron. But they tell you it goes from neutron to proton. So you're going from a neutron to a proton. Neutron up, up, down. Proton up, down, down. So the difference here is that an up is becoming a down. In fact, so confusing, I mix the two up. It's going up, down, down to up, up, down. There we go. We're going down to up. And that makes it confusing because this first choice is actually up to down. So yeah, it's a little nasty. But ultimately, this is a baryon. It's made of three quarks. And this is a baryon. It's made of three quarks. Unlike leptons, which leptons, if you remember, or one of these six things. Everything else that's matter is made up of quarks and is either a baryon made of three quarks or a meson made of two quarks. 38. B, very similar to question 28. At the top, you have no potential energy. I mean, you have no kinetic energy. You have potential energy. Or at it, when they give you the weight force, don't forget that is the same as mg, so it kind of saves you a step. So you have 320 joules of total energy at the top, and it's all in potential energy. At the bottom, the potential energy is zero. We don't know the kinetic energy quite yet, but we're told that the internal energy that it gained on the way down was 50 joules. So the total energy, which should be potential plus kinetic plus internal energy, 320 joules to start, potential energy of zero, mystery kinetic energy, plus 50 joules. That tells us the kinetic energy had to be 270 joules. And the block is a little bit warmer at the bottom. 39. A. Again, draw the big picture. Rocket. You go from an initial position upwards to a final position. Students will automatically do worse on this on average, not individual students, because they've given it to you in scientific notation. Just go ahead and make that 20 meters per second squared for the acceleration and make that 9,000 meters for the D. So we now know that you've gone a displacement or distance of 9,000 meters. You had an acceleration of 20 meters per second squared. The fact that it's at rest is code word for initial velocity is zero meters per second squared. Now it's a matter of picking an equation where you know everything except the thing you're trying to find out. The thing we're trying to find out is time. This is our best equation to use here. Equation without anything in it. Substitute with units. T equals 30 seconds, which of course, just to be contrary, is 3 times 10 to the 1 seconds. The answer is A. And finally, 40. A. This is that famous equation, E equals mc squared. When you have matter uh, annihilate one another, or when matter can actually be converted into pure energy, according to this formula. So E equals mc squared. And when you plug in the mass, it has to be in kilograms. In this case, it already is. So 2 
times 10 to the minus 5 kilograms times the speed of light squared of 18 times 10 to the 11 joules or 1.8 times 10 to the 12 joules but don't forget about the prefixes on the first page of the reference table times 10 to the 12 is tera so this is 1.8 tera joules by the way if that mass is given in atomic mass units you can jump right to this fact here one atomic mass unit or one amu like if you took a whole proton and you completely annihilated it you would have this many mega electron volts of energy now times 10 to the 2 it's easier just to write 931 MeV. And where this becomes important is in something called the binding energy. Like if you take the little pieces, like the protons, and neutrons, and electrons of an atom, for example, hydrogen, and you could somehow mass that, you would find that the mass of the pieces is actually more than the mass of the assembled atom. The difference in that mass is called the mass defect. And where does that energy go? It goes into something called the binding energy. It actually takes energy to hold the protons together because they want to repel one another they're all positive charges so there's an uh, there's an energy there and that comes from a decrease in the mass at 931 mega electron volts per atomic mass unit so if you've made it this far i applaud you and i wish you luck and the fact that you're here tells me you have a real good shot at doing well my advice to you would be slow down you always want to check to make sure you're answering the actual question that's being asked Physics is a scenario or is a class where it can feel so right to be answering the wrong question. Example, I throw a ball straight up in the air, right at the very top, what's the acceleration? Did you just say zero? It's minus 9.8 meters per second squared or downward. It, you you, you want to answer and you want to say zero because you know that, you understand the situation so much so that you didn't listen to the actual question. The question asked for acceleration and you gave me velocity. If I had to ask velocity, that'd be the right answer. So you gave me the right answer to the wrong question. Scientific notation, just the intuition goes down. You're better off converting it to regular numbers where possible. This is especially true when you do the almost every year they have a question on estimation. Convert those to regular numbers and you'll be better off. Some facts to know an apple weighs about a newton, a person weighs about a thousand newtons, or a little less. A paper clip's about one gram, a person's about a hundred kilograms, at least a linebacker, but that's close enough. You always want to read for clue words, things like at rest means initial velocity is zero, constant velocity means net force is zero, and the acceleration is zero. When you are doing vectors, you want to draw them exceedingly carefully. It's plus or minus 0.2 centimeters. So draw it, draw the arrow, measure the tip to the end of the arrow, and make sure it's the same. If it's not, redraw. It's worth taking the time. Same thing with the angles. It's very unforgiving, plus or minus two degrees. Use the protractor very slowly. Double check, triple check, quadruple check. It's worth it. You know equation, substitution, answer with unit. Any reasonable physics student knows this. But they tend to forget a unit somewhere. And where they tend to forget it is either they forget the equation because they jump right into plugging in. They're so excited to do physics. Who's not? Or when they plug in, I notice this with constants, like G, 6.67 times 10 to negative 11 kilogram meters, I'm sorry, Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Y you need that stuff. So you just got to be very, very careful. But the biggest thing is to breathe. Unlike most of your practice, you have three hours if you want it to do the exam. Just go slowly, carefully, make sure you've answered all the questions that are being asked. And don't forget to have a good time. I know for some of you, this is your last thing of high school. So I really hope you cherish that moment. I would. This is turning into a long video. So I'm going to stop. Good luck.